the cognitive dissonance here on display is at a level that you just you kind of shake your head and say can you not see how you're just blatantly contradicting yourself repeatedly but his desire to be authentic and true to his inner self forces everyone around him to be inauthentic the term dead name is probably the saddest thing that i've ever heard and what it represents is a person dying Hello, and welcome to the Pop Culture Contrarian podcast with Thomas Sterling and Andrew. Hello. Hey, guys. Our topic today is Will and Harper, the new Netflix movie from Will Ferrell featuring a road trip with him and his buddy, and we'll, we'll get into it in a second. But first, make sure to like and subscribe. Hit that bell button if you're on YouTube so you see when we upload a video. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. It's really helpful, and we love to hear from you. And let's get started. All right, so I, I didn't really give it anything away yet. So, Thomas, you put this onto our, our, our plate here. So tell us about Will and Harper. Yeah, I, and I'm not sure what clued me into it, but basically this is a film about Will's longtime friend who was also a lead writer at SNL when he was at mm-hmm. SNL. Yeah, who, Saturday Night Live. Yeah, who at in his, I guess, mid to late 50s, decided that he wanted to transition and, you know, become a woman. And then one day I got this email. Hey, Will, something I need you to know. I'll be transitioning to live as a woman. I don't doubt that Will is my friend, but I'm not Andrew Steele anymore. It was just, whoa. And so he, I guess it happened, what he let everybody know during COVID is, I think, what it said. I'm not sure... During the movie, he's 61, and he says he transitioned a year ago. So I think he transitioned at 60, just to be clear on that. Okay, okay. So anyway, it it seems like basically he reached out to Will. And a whole bunch of people. And a whole bunch of other people to basically inform him, you know, he's coming out as trans. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of, it's, it's clearly designed as a movie to kind of support this and promote this and kind of show that, you know, Will's friends with his buddy, no matter what kind of a deal, you know, that is the underlying thing, but it's very clearly oriented toward promoting the the, this whole notion of transgender identity being legitimate in it. Yeah. And those who reject it are effectively bigots. Yeah. They don't spend a lot of time on people who reject it. No, they don't. It's an under... Tone. It's an undercurrent for the whole yeah. trip, though. That, I mean, that's part yeah. of his It's not journey. overt, really. Well, and with, yeah, and actually, it is part of the journey, and it's the reason for the journey, even. Right. Because, yeah. so this guy, Andrew Steele, I guess is his actual last name. Yeah. yeah. Now going spent, by Harper Steele. Now going by Harper Steele. Spent 60 years of his life as a man. He has two daughters. He's a father. They still mm-hmm. call him Pa. He would spend all this time on road trips, go into bars, go into, you know, kind of, Places that a woman by herself wouldn't want to go. Yeah, it's kind of tied to his work of writing and and traveling the country and doing stuff like that. Right. And so now that he has transitioned, which you can't audibly tell a difference, you can barely tell that this guy is dressed up like a woman, he's now suddenly afraid that going into all these bars is dangerous for him. I guess because he's afraid people will gang up on him, not because he's physically any weaker than he was before. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I found that whole aspect ridiculous that suddenly these things are dangerous. Like in, when he meets with his friends from SNL, one of them says, or or he says, I was going down an alley and I suddenly felt, you know, scared like I hadn't before. And people were like, yeah, of course. And another person said, when is it ever safe to walk down an alley by yourself? (laughs) Yeah. 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 But one of the females said, yeah, it's not safe now. Yeah, exactly. Which was... Interesting. Well, I think there w- there was a little bit of playing to the, you know, stereotypes, that comment, you know, like the notion of a woman walking by herself is a dangerous scenario. We all know this to be the case, which shouldn't be surprising given the nature of reality. But when that woman's actually a 60 year old man. <laughs> but so there's that. But I thought also, you know, when they're packing for the trip, they show Harper sitting there and he's like putting together like all all these shoes and dresses and stuff like that kind of like 
is the stereotype of a woman packing. Right. So they, they played off of these little things, I guess, as expressions of his true identity, I guess is, is kind of the idea there. Yeah. And I, and I'll put this up front and we, we kind of talked about, all of us kind of saw this, the cognitive dissonance here on display is at a level that you just, you kind of shake your head and say, can you not see how you're just blatantly contradicting yourself repeatedly? You know? Well, and the scene at the diner when Harper meets up with his daughters is the best example of that, I think. Well, there's a lot of good examples of it. There, yeah, there, there is, are. but in this especially, Will Ferrell is, the whole time he's kind of asking these questions, and they're more or less genuine questions that you would ask in that situation. If you were in that situation, I don't think any of us ever would be. But they're also kind of performative, kind of, you know the right answer, I'm giving you a chance to say it. Mm-hmm. And so he asks Harper, Andrew's daughters, you know, what do you, he's still dad, right? And they're like, yeah, he's dad or pa. I, pop? Pop, pop, I think pop. was the name they used. Uh, he's yeah. still dad or pop, but they say she's pop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that example right there, she's pop, she's dad, is just the most outrageous example of you, you have to short circuit your brain to mm-hmm. operate in the same realm as these people. I can't yeah. imagine how it would feel as a kid. And from what I saw, at least on screen, it seems that his daughters are fairly well accepting of this. Mm -hmm. They seem like the kind of people who are probably, you know, they're young, progressive type young women, more than likely. I mean, we didn't see a lot from them, so it's hard to know for sure. We didn't get to know them. Right. And of course, they're on film for a documentary with a super famous guy who happens to be their dad's friend and it's a Netflix documentary. Yeah. And so they're going to say the right thing, I guess. Yeah. Whether or not they believe it, they're definitely going to say the right thing yeah. in that situation. And I don't know, maybe they accept it. But one thing that I can't remember which daughter mentioned mm-hmm. this, but they said, Hey, you know, dad was my one masculine role model, my one example yeah. of, and it's like, now I kind of don't really have that anymore. And then she says, I don't really need it. <laughs> Which is what? It's outrageous. Just, just here's a quick little fun fact. Women with brothers do better interacting with men across their entire lives. Mm-hmm. It's just a thing that women or men with the opposite sex in their life do better interacting with that opposite sex throughout mm-hmm. their life. Yeah. So you do need it. Men need women who they know and, and can respect and look up to and, and vice versa as well. And I think maybe what she was getting at was my father has already served that role in the fundamental like developmental stages of my life. And now I'm an adult and no longer need that. Maybe that's what she thinks. Yeah. But still, I couldn't help but just feel sad Yeah, for this family. And that is kind of the pervading element of this movie from, I think, everyone's perspective. Mm-hmm. Even if you're accepting and you're sad because of the how hard this person's life has been. Yeah. And if you're not accepting, you're sad because this person reached. I This is something I was thinking about. Andrew slash Harper reached this point where they were, he was at rock bottom. And, you know, that's a moment when you should, if if the world is operating the way I believe it should, that's the moment you find Christ. Yeah. And you find, oh, there is actually something that, that fills these holes in my life and fixes these problems I have. And it's accepting that I need to turn my life over to Christ. And instead, people around him told him, yeah, you can be a girl. Just, you know, have surgeries and start taking hormones and that'll fix everything. And it doesn't, it doesn't fix anything. One more thing on the aspect of sorrow and all of this. The term dead name is probably the saddest thing that I've ever heard. And what it represents is a person dying. Yeah. Literally. And they say, this is dead to me now. Who I was is dead to me now. And there's only one instance where I find that that's not sad. And that is what you said, Sterling, when you give your life to Christ Mm -hmm. and you are now alive in Christ and dead to sin. Yeah, yeah. The, old, the old man is, is the old dead. man is dead. Yeah. Right. But, and this right. is a very different, this is kind of a perversion of that idea of this transformation, this Phoenix moment. Yeah. Because 
instead of walking into who you are, you're walking further away yeah. from who you are. Further into confusion and and self-destruction and sin and just just every part of this story is sad. But I want to make one thing clear about this person, Andrew Harper, et cetera. I really do feel a lot of sympathy for somebody who is going through this. I think it's a genuine but with this guy, I get the feeling that it's really genuine. It's not an attention seeking thing necessarily. I think that it's somebody, and maybe there are elements of that, but I mean, he talked about, I felt this way since I was a kid and I kept it locked away. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that there are mental disorders that afflict people that make them not feel right as themselves. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, I'm not a doctor. The only thing I can say is, you know, come to Jesus, but, and maybe there are other things that I don't understand about it. But I really can't imagine that embracing a deficiency or not a deficiency. I can't imagine that embracing a disorder yeah. is healing. Right. Well, so Thomas, yeah. if you can answer that, yeah. that point as well, do you believe this is genuine? Then I want to answer it as well, but I want to hear from you first. That he, I genuine, I mean, genuine that he feels this way. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. I think he genuinely feeling I don't dis disembodied. I don't know how, how I guess my question is in a world where we haven't gone completely crazy on the trans issue, but gender dysphoria is still something that is diagnosed. It is a mental believe, disorder. Yeah. Right. I'm saying, I'm saying if we live in the world where trans isn't the situation as it is now, yeah. but people do still get diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Do you think this person would have been diagnosed? He may have, I don't know. It, it, yeah, maybe he he does seem to have what he's indicating. He, this is where the whole identity point I wanted to bring into this is. There's this there's this something about identity that the who am I element that that this is this dissociation with their physical body. The people who mm -hmm. so if this gender dysphoria maybe is this they're 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 feeling that they're in the wrong body for whatever reason which you know I'm I don't know the all the ins and outs of that the psychology of that but they're feeling this and thinking they're the op and for whatever reason they connect with well I think I'm the opposite sex or opposite yeah. gender however we want to put that and that seems to be this kind of constant from at least from his telling of it we take him at his word constant thing that's afflicted him for years where he's tried to he, he just doesn't feel that he is like, at, at some point he gets to this point where he doesn't feel that he's male and the thing that this is where the cognitive dissonance comes in because there's a sense of constantly saying things like you need to be your authentic self yeah or i remember one one of the quotes that i I pointed out was, oh, this one, a lot of transitioning is learning to accept yourself. Yeah. Okay. So then that, that, that raises the question, then what is your identity? What is your self? Mm -hmm. Because we would say. Your yeah, body is one of the primary your pieces of who your you physical, are. Mm -hmm. Your physical elements, what you look like that you don't look like, you know, some super, superstar athlete or some actor or, you know, that everybody can be critical of how they look, how they appear, mm -hmm. wish they didn't have the nose they did or, you know, the hair they did or the lack of hair or all these things are elements that which we can be, that we all can relate to being self-critical of our physical being. Yeah. So, you know, learning to basically accept what you look like, accept the body that God's given you, accept the reality of your limitations. Honestly, that's a lot of what it yeah. is is part of maturing, growing up. And for whatever reason, you know, he's recognizing, that's the irony. He's recognizing that reality, but then he's twisted it to the transitioning and the fact that he still doesn't look like a woman. He's having mm -hmm. to, and sound like a woman. I think that was the relationship yeah. to it, how, he's, how he talked. He had to just accept that. Yeah, that was the, another trans, an actual man right. dressed up as a woman who said that. Yeah. Just going back to, do I believe this is genuine, like a genuine mental disorder where his whole life he's believed he's a woman? For me, no, I don't believe that. 
okay. So what what would you? How would you classify it? In, in, so, so I just just outline why I don't believe it, okay. and, and then we'll get to that. Oh, that's so, what I mean. I guess yeah. That's part so of what he he talks about you know when I was a uh, in middle school, my sister gave me some white bell bottoms that I really liked, and I went to a skate park, and another skater kid said slur at me about wearing those, and said don't bring those again next time, and I never wore them again. And so that's maybe the earliest thing I heard from him talking about how he thought he was a girl was wearing white bell-bottom jeans in middle school. And then there's some references later to, or later in his life, earlier in the movie, to being in therapy and his therapist telling him, you know, this seems like it's coming from a place of anger. And I wrote it down somewhere exactly what the therapist said, I think. Living in fantasy is what she said, or the therapist said, and also it comes from a place of anger and denial or something like that. And so the therapist didn't believe him. And clearly this is something he's dealt with for seven years or so because he bought a house to dress up as a girl in something like seven years before. Out in California. I but th- to I me- think that would indicate he's dealing with it a long, lot longer than that if he's buying a house. W- yes, yes. But to me, it's less, I genuinely believe a girl, I'm a girl and more, this is my kink. That's, that's what it seemed like more to me. Maybe so. You know, I think one distinction between this person's experience and then the trans issue at large mm-hmm. was a conversation he and Will have in the vehicle while they're driving. They're driving a Jeep Grand Wagoneer, this mm-hmm. classic vehicle. Um, that's just an aside. The car was maybe the coolest part of the movie. Because I happen to like cars, so that's just a little aside. They're having this conversation about the term, the terms, essentially, mm-hmm. like trans woman or woman. And Will asks something to the extent of, you know, are you a woman more or less? And Andrew Harper says that he's struggled with that and has decided that he is accepts trans woman and that he's living life as a woman. And I think that's a really different kind of narrative that we hear in the really mainstream arguments on the left right now. Yeah. It's different from the, the, well, you hear the whole idea trans women are women saying that there is no difference. Right. The activists will tell you they are the same thing. And and at least in this person's stating this person's experience is that, no, I'm living life as a woman. That's my persona, but I'm a trans woman, meaning that I'm a third thing Mm -hmm. or not really a woman, AKA. Yeah. This is where I would go with that. Um, I'm, I'm, my identity is female, but trapped inside a male body. Because I think that to me is the most consistent explanation for this. Mm -hmm. And so when there's the demand of being recognized as a woman, what, what basically this ideology has done is elevated feelings as fact. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I think that's the crux here, Thomas, if you feel it, irrespective of what your body physically actually is, it's secondary to what your personal feel felt identity is. And so if your personal felt identity is female, that's why they insist on recognizing that individual as female, because they're saying that's what their actual identity is, Mm -hmm. irrespective to what their physical reality is. And so I think that's the clash of the two cultures because the insistence is saying feelings are fact. And the other side or our side would say, no, feelings don't, feelings don't, they may reflect facts or they may contradict facts. Mm. They're a metric. But this is a point you've made many times, Thomas, but just adding another level of nuance to what you just explained. They may say, yeah, my body's male. My inner identity is female. It's not female. It's what I believe female yeah, to be. To be, because you can't really know right, if you're exactly. not that. Yeah, that, it's a divorce of the notion that your physical. We all live in a physical world. We have eyes, ears, mm. f- the five senses by which we experience the physical world. Right. We interpret the physical world through those senses, and so how we even see ourselves, how you know everything around us is being filtered through our senses and our sense. Yeah. And, and so we have to, we're dependent upon that, right? To know things. And so to know what it feels like to be a woman, you would have to actually have the physical elements of that to actually know that. Yeah. 
outside of that, you're just fantasizing about what you believe it might feel like, but you don't actually know what it feels like yeah. and vice yeah. versa. And that seemed rather apparent to me in one of the barroom scenes mm-hmm. where he was initially interacting with some other women. Yeah. The, well, actually there's two different times. I'll mention this one. I'll mention one other in the barroom scene and two ladies come up and we're talking to him and I could on the screen, you can feel the tension mm-hmm. of, and you kind of think that these women are not sure, but they might actually think he's a woman because they're both very drunk. Yeah. Everybody in that bar was extremely yeah. drunk. <sighs> Good times in the bar, but <laughs> geez. But I was just thinking in that moment, what might be going through this guy's mind because he has no frame of reference mm. for the interactions of women because women interact with each other differently yeah. than men do. And we know it insofar as we can witness it. Yeah. And we also know that we interact with just men differently than we interact with just women. Mm-hmm. And so I guess that's also to your point, Thomas, kind of a fantasy, fantasize or maybe an extrapolation is a better word. The other moment was at the very end when Will Ferrell gives Andrew some diamond earrings. Yeah. And he's like all excited. Like, these are so cool. They're so pretty. I'm like, dude, you're still using like regular dude language. Well, that, that was something I noticed throughout a lot of the, there's, there's funny moments. It's Will Ferrell. He's a comedian. And, and this other guy is a comedy writer for years, decades. So of course yeah, there's going to be, be humor in it. All the jokes were guy, guy jokes. Oh yeah. Throughout the movie. All the body language was guy, guy yeah. body language. I mean, they're like in f- jumping up in front of the different signs and stuff, like running into the ocean. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, how can you live obviously for 60 years as a man and not have those natural tendencies because that's your natural way of being. Right. That's so there are, you do meet occasionally men who come off more effeminate. Sure. This guy, Andrew is not one of them. Yeah. He, he does not have effeminate mannerisms, which some men do have, even though they're, they're not pretending they're a woman or anything. They're just men, but they have kind of female or feminine mannerisms. This guy, Andrew does not, he just does not come across to me as someone who, who was genuinely struggled with this. It seems much more like he built up this fantasy in his head of what if I could be a woman and lived with that fantasy for decades until he was like, I'm going to do it because screw it. What I feel is the most important thing to do. And I think it'll make me feel good. Yeah. I mean, you you know, you're meant, you mentioned like, I I like, I think the key thing here is identity. I think in a fallen world where people, and especially when people have lost connection with God, They don't know who they are in a sense. And they're wrestling with trying to find happiness. I thought that was a key point. This is what is going to make me happy. Mm -hmm. Happiness is like, has become God for, for in this situation. And they're, 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 they're just longing to feel this kind of complete happiness. And in his mind, he envisioned that if he could be a woman and walk the streets as a woman and everyone just kind of recognize him as a woman, that yeah. would be like his happiness almost. And yet, and so that's what he, and it's almost like these, these folks, they want, they demand this of the, everybody else because this is their, their fantasy happiness. If, mm-hmm. if everyone would see me as the opposite sex, then I will, I will find that I have arrived at my, you know, your true self, true self. That's almost the, the thesis of this movie. Yeah. And I think that the the problem is society society doesn't want to lie about something that's obviously false. You know, to be male is is an objective standard. It's not about feelings. Feelings come into it, but it's not about feelings primarily. It's about an, an objective physical reality, reality, and and vice versa. And so, when you're telling society, this person doesn't they effectively feel like they're in the wrong body. So they're going to dress up and act the way, and you're going to, you're going to accept them as actually the opposite gender because that's how they feel. And society is supposed to embrace this. That's effectively what we're being told. And you're hateful if you refuse to embrace the lie. And, and that's where the, 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 the culture clash is currently happening, I think. And that's where we watch the film and, and, and they're moving parts 
of it for sure. But like you said, sadness was an element throughout the whole thing because you know, even if this guy's never going to be a woman, he's just never is. And if he thinks that somehow transitioning is being his authentic self and they use the term trans and I was just, and I've said this multiple times, this is trans is a fiction. There's no such thing as trans. Yeah. What is transhuman? It doesn't exist. There's either male or females. And then all it is, is people feeling that they're in the wrong body. And so they call this trans and then they attempt to make themselves look different. Yeah. And somehow they're saying I'm being authentic and it's, it's sad. It is sad. One of the, well, I won't get into that. I don't think we need to, but one of the points I was thinking the entire time I was watching this movie was this Andrew Harper's desire to be authentic in his words, which is obviously like just visually, obviously not true. You're not chasing what's authentic because what's authentic is obviously male and you aren't and you're pretending to be a woman, but his desire to be authentic and true to his inner self forces everyone around him to be inauthentic. Yeah. That's a good point. That is a really great point. Yeah. There is something that's authentic throughout the movie and that's the friendship between Will Ferrell and this, this man Harper. Certainly. But the, the interactions around gender around even Will Ferrell at one point they're sitting at dinner and Will Ferrell or, or Harper's like, you know, my makeup makes me feel even worse because the makeup looks good, but I just look so obviously male and Will Fer and Harper has just said, literally, I look so I have such a masculine face and Will Ferrell says, you look beat, 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 beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and it, he's just so obviously lying. Like it's, it's the, no, honey, that dress doesn't make you look fat lie on steroids. Yeah. It's the emperor's new clothes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, hey, everybody, feelings matter more than reality. So we, people's feelings, the worst thing you can do is offend people's feelings. That's yeah. effectively the value system here. And so if it means denying reality, then by all means deny reality because, yeah. hey, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. And that's, that's where it is. And that's where we are. And, it, you know, it's kind of like, it's interesting that we don't have this conversation around something like anorexia or something where, yeah. you know, because we know that that is a genuine also mental illness. Where, and it's, it's body dysmorphia as well, where right. they look in a mirror, see a 90 pound girl and think she's fat. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you know, the, where some the extreme examples, they starve themselves to death or something. Yeah. It, it, you know, we recognize this isn't good for you. This actually, you're believing a lie about yourself and we need to try to yeah. help you out of that lie. That's what, you know, the first therapist, I think, was trying to get at. Yeah. You're, you have a perspective where you're effectively a fantasy, which is not, not reality. And yeah. you're allowing that fantasy to to basically define for you what you think should sh- will make you happy and what will fulfill your life. And I mean, we all have, we all, because we're fallen, have to wrestle with varying different fantasies or beliefs and lies that we think, if I just was able to obtain this, I'm going to be fulfilled. I'm going to be happy. And this is just an extreme example of that. You know, and I, so I think we can relate and I think that's an, it's important to relate, even though we might not identify with the same feeling. We can certainly relate with the same scenario of believing a lie and trying to hold on to a lie and trying to make a lie the truth. And I think that is the human experience. Yeah. yeah. And so in that sense, and I think that there's two words here that I think are important to dis- distinguish. There's empathy and there's sympathy. And I think we can certainly sympathize with this, right? Yeah, most definitely. That what gets us into trouble is when we empathize because when we empathize, we're almost like believing the lie. We're like putting ourselves emotionally into it as him. And I think that's what this movie is attempting to do. It's not just trying to get you to sympathize. Oh yeah. It's trying to get you to empathize. And if it can get you to empathize, then it can get you to accept. Yeah. Yeah, It wants, whenever you hear about transgender laws being passed. It doesn't want you to hear the word transgender. It wants you to hear Harper and think of this guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the point. And 
it's worth mentioning that most of the legislation surrounding transgender stuff that's arisen recently has nothing to do with 60 year old men deciding to dress up like women. No, it has to do with six year old boys being told by their usually crazy leftist mom, you're actually a girl. Yeah. I noticed a snippet when they were talking about the political side very briefly, by the way, after the basketball basketball game, game, the governors, and there were some news headlines, you know, anchors delivering the stories about transgenderism. And most of the things I heard about it, or at least half, sounded like they're talking about the transgender child issue. Yeah, they were. Almost all of them were. But, so, they, but they couch it as anti-trans legislation or anti-LGB yeah. legislation uh, without informing you. No, what this is is to prevent minors, children, from being subjected to gender-bending procedures. To harm. Yeah. To harm them physically. To sterilization in many, many cases. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's a bigger problem than they want to admit. I think their story came out just, what, this week or last week about the number of hospitals in the U.S. that are actually engaged in this type of stuff on minors. So over 200, I think. Wow. Well, the film, it was emotional. It was well done. I mean, it yeah, was very- they know how to make a movie. It was beautiful music, beautiful footage. I mean, who doesn't want was, to take yeah. a road trip across America? Yeah, it, it showcases a lot of beauty um, in the nation. And I think to your point, Thomas, it was showcasing an empathy of a friend to a friend. Will Ferrell was clearly trying to be a friend yeah. to a long time- Buddy and probably a very good friend. Cause I mean, you're yeah. not going to take a 14 day road trip with somebody that you don't have a history with and that you don't like. Yeah. And so it attempts to create, as you said, Thomas, this, it breaks down the barriers yeah. by using these tools to, as you said, Sterling, think of Harper every mm-hmm. time you hear this, the trans agenda legislation or whatever in the news. Yeah. Yeah. It's an attempt to move culture in the direction of acceptance rather than rejection of this, this um, ideology. And that's why it's, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing is what this is. And it's, it's, it's these types of things that are very dangerous. And, and it's the reason why it's difficult to know how to respond to it because Nobody wants to be classified as a bigot and a hater. And yeah. well, if, and even beyond that, you don't want to just be a jerk right, for, yeah. for j- being a jerk's sake. You want to have a purpose to, to right, what you're saying. Right. And so the notion that if I stand against this, somehow I'm standing against a person seeking happiness and fulfillment and their best life or whatever it may be. That's the narrative that's been set up. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is, well, who are you to tell them that they're not allowed to feel this way? Yeah. And I I think that's a little bit of a red herring because it's not the, I'm not trying to say you're not allowed to feel this way. I'm just saying your feelings don't get to dictate reality. Yeah. Specifically the behavior of those around you. Yeah. And, and there's a selfishness there that was, that is just ignored. Yep. I mean, I don't also put it, it's just, it's almost as obvious as him being a man trying to dress as a woman, that the element of selfishness here, his, his marriage ends, everyone's supposed to call him by these new pronouns, female pronouns. Everyone is corrected if they miss, misgender, which mm-hmm. is the irony. They're not actually misgender. Right. They are correctly assessing yeah. his gender. And yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so that, that was another thing too. Everything was about him, how he felt his quote, authentic lived life or experience that everyone would recognize that as legitimate and real and true. There's so much selfishness packed into that, that is not addressed at all. And in fact, everyone who might challenge or question, and this is what I think was interesting when he vi- was visiting Iowa City where he grew up mm-hmm. and was visiting his sister there. And they had this conversation with his sister and they were asking about how his sister responded to the news that he you know, had come out as trans and everything like mm-hmm. that. And what I thought was interesting was her statement was, well, I didn't really question it or take time to question it. I basically just accepted it and said, I just need it as fast as I can. Just this is what mm-hmm. needs to be. And to me, 
that's what the, the, instead of actually people wrestling with it and pointing out things and saying, Hey, look, this is inconsistent here. This is a lie here. This is a lie here. This is not what people have been are being conditioned to do is don't question except yep. immediately. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's the reason these people do this. And it's yeah. so obvious throughout the movie. If you're watching Andrew slash Harper, his questions the entire time are, are other people accepting that I am a woman? Mm-hmm. Are they, do they believe that I'm Harper? Or do they think I'm just playing dress up? And that's his worry the entire time because he is just Andrew playing dress up and he needs outside validation constantly throughout the movie in order to feel like he's made the right choice. And he has not. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's, I think one of my biggest takeaways is if we can get people to stop playing along, this will end. They, they won't keep doing it just for themselves, despite what they say. They need the outside validation. So we've gone for almost 40 minutes now. So we have two mm-hmm. questions that we answer every time we have yeah. a movie on here. Right. So let's do that. So question one, is this movie woke? Yes. It's very woke. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. maybe the wokest. Yeah. There's no question. It, it, I guess it could be woker. You don't have any purple haired people screaming at you. Yeah. It was woke. And how do I describe this? It was high art woke. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I, yeah. It was not, it was documentary woke. It wasn't like in your face, cringy woke. It was emotional woke. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty heavy handed. I would say, I think that it was done in a way of saying of folks who live within effectively an echo chamber bubble. And so yeah. Yeah. there, there's not a questioning really of their worldview at all. The only questions they're addressing are, will this be more broadly accepted? That's the only concern. There's not an actual, are we, is what we're doing right? Is what we're believing right? Is this, no, that, that is, it's, there is no question on that. We point. are right. Everyone else is wrong. Yep. You need to figure out, yeah. can, will other people change their mind about yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Will yeah. they lie to me Yeah. To, to make me feel good? Yeah. All right. So that's the one question. Is it woke? Yes. There's no debate about this. Yeah. It's woke. I think it could be woker, but it's, you know, it's an eight out of 10 on the woke scale for sure. Other question, speaking of out of 10. Where do you rate this movie out of 10? Well, for what it is, I mean, I think it accomplishes all the things that it meant to do. Yeah, that's true. So I would give it like an eight insofar as that's concerned. I mean, my personal enjoyment of the film, I mean, like a three probably. (laughs) I did happen to really appreciate the cinematography and the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was put together in about as professional a way as you could ever do. I mean, this is part of the reason why the left feels that they own the medium of film. They happen to be really good at it. <laughs> they are really good at it. Can't so, deny that. So yes, it was, even with the subject matter being things that were very disturbing, mm-hmm. it was still somehow enjoyable to watch in a weird way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Just because it was well put together. So yeah, but insofar as me agreeing with it and also just being so sad about it. If someone asks you, should I watch the movie? What do you rate it out of 10? Your answer is going to be like three. It depends on who's asking. Yeah. And really? Uh, yeah. Okay. It does depend on All who's right. asking. I, I, I think that it, I kind of agree with you there. I don't, I don't know if I'd give it eight. I'd probably give it seven, but I understand your logic behind it. It's, it's well done for what it is. Yeah, it's, it's a documentary, but it also when we talk, it's woke messaging is it doesn't feel as ham ham fisted with his woke mm-hmm. messaging maybe. Mm-hmm. But a part of that I think is because it's the buy-in is so high. The buy-in is so high. It doesn't feel like it, 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 it would be, I think it recognizes in one sense, you don't preach the choir choir believes it. So there's that element. So you don't have to be ham fisted with it that way. And so the little bit in which they're concerned about will people be accepting, that's more of the question. And so they're just kind of exploring that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that's what this movie does. I thought that the value of it though, is that it gives you more of a, more of a window because I do think for all this authentic talk, I think there was an honesty there of them, of him trying to say, this is how I honestly feel. And I didn't question that. And I think that, he was trying to express that and he was willing to even like you were saying, concede that, yeah, he's not 
a real physical woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He kept using the, you know, the term trans, even though he demanded, demanded for the most part, you know, the pronouns and everything. Mm-hmm. And he was frustrated or he was, he was frustrated as much as other people not recognizing him as a woman, as he himself not recognizing himself as a woman. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. You know, like you said, with a makeup thing or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I would say I'd give it a seven. Well done. It is hard to watch. It's like you said, it's it's sad, but it's informative, very informative. I think, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay. So I see what you mean about the craftsmanship of this movie. The craftsmanship wise, it's quite good. Seven or eight, yeah. In terms of if anyone in the world came up to me, there's one exception, and I'll like outline that in a second. Anyone in the world came up to me and said, hey, should I watch Will and Harper on Netflix? How would you rate it for me? I would say, one or two out of 10 stars. <laughs> Don't watch this movie. It's a bad movie. The exception is if you treat it as opposition research, if you treat it as what are these people thinking? You know, I'm, I'm, if you're someone who's engaged in this kind of world of what do we do about transgenderism? It's a useful movie to watch and it's watchable, but I wouldn't recommend anyone else on earth who's not treating it as a opposition research. Watch this movie. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. I think that one of the th- one of the dangers when when we're dealing with something that's at its root evil, mm-hmm. okay, is so identifying the individual with the evil that we forget that they're an individual, a human being mm-hmm. who's made in the image of God, and that they need salvation just like yeah. I do. And so, what this film does help you do, like I said, this is why I said the the sympathy factor I think is important here. It can help you sympathize with the struggle, but you don't have to accept his self false self definition of himself. Yeah. And so you see him as a human being who's wrestling. And I think there's value in in that, but I would caution don't let that then inform you on what is actually true. Right. That's that's kind of what I mean. If you're yeah. Megan Kelly, who's almost as incensed about transgender stuff as I am, then I'd say maybe watch this movie. I think it'll be informative and you will you'll have a human face to put on this yeah. issue, which yeah. is to some degree useful. But if you're someone who doesn't care about politics, I would say stay away from this movie because I, I think for those kind of people, it, it in a way is dangerous. OK. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I guess that's a pretty natural <laughs> ending point there. Yeah. Yep. So. You know, that's Will and Harper. If you've watched it, tell us what you think. We'd like to hear some other opinions. Are any of us crazy? It's probably me. It's always you, Stuart. It's always me. All right, that's our episode for today. We are the Pop Culture Contrarians. We're brought to you by the Patriot Post, which is the oldest conservative news digest on the web. It's right and it's free. Be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. See you guys.